Welcome to Words on the Outside with Laura Bynum. Today's reading features Laura Bynum, an author whose influences include Margaret Atwood, Philip K. Dick, Louise Erdrich, and Aaron Sorkin, reading from her speculative fiction novel, The Hyde. Laura will be reading from Chapter 1, in which main character Reese, a woman with synesthesia and no family history, has followed a pulling cord to a little town on the banks of the Mississippi. The dinner shift over and the restaurant closed, the pizza her co-worker has ordered has just arrived. Hello, I say, flipping on the overhead light and stepping out onto the porch. The delivery person, a woman, doesn't answer. With her head down, eyes on the boards beneath her feet, the first thing I see of her is a vertical stripe of pink scalp, then exploding away from it, white frayed hair. Some of it has been combed, as evidenced by the tine marks preserved in a mixture of dirt and oil. The rest has been left in knotted clumps so thick and hardened, they stand erect, at odds with gravity. How much? I ask, while resisting the urge to cover my nose. The woman's flannel shirt, several sizes too big, smells of mildew. Her equally too large trousers, fallen to her hips, smell of urine. As she turns to drop her carrier on the porch, our pizza already extracted, the back of the woman's shirt moves and I can see one of her exposed hips. There's nothing of substance there, just some skin covering a bit of bone that looks more like the head of a knitting needle than anything to which muscle and tendon could be affixed. The woman turns back around. Keeping her face averted, she shoves the pizza box into my chest. Twelve dollars, twenty-five cents, she grumbles. Immediately, banks of colored numbers appear around me, triggered, not chosen, spawned by a need to calculate that's been hardwired in me for as long as I can remember. Some of these numbers exist within arm's reach. Most occupy a space farther away. All of them together act as my counting mechanism, though really, I've never had to count so much as choose. The answer to any equation glows brighter within my floating sea of numbers. It's no more work than turning my mind's eye towards the showiest one. This is just one way in which my synesthesia works. I also see letters in color, have a combined taste-smell reaction to certain sounds or words, like Jeremy, which smells of cabbage, and I see colors when listening to music. It seems that as I age, I'm manifesting new and increasingly more unusual ways of perceiving and interacting with the world. I sometimes worry that if I'm too long-lived, I might have to relocate to Mars, like Dr. Manhattan. Twelve dollars twenty-five cents, the woman said. Twelve twenty-five is what I see. The cost of the pizza, a purple number floating twelve rows from my left, three columns down. Fifteen hundred is the amount of money in my right hand. A red number located fifteen rows from my left and sitting at the top of its column. Two seventy-five, a bright blue number, would be the money left over and the woman's tip, which given her state now feels insufficient. I pat down my trousers for any additional bills and find one rumpled in a back pocket. Three seventy-five, this new forest green tip glows bright in its position on my left-hand side, near to my body. Its sparkling display means, yes, this new number is the right amount of generous. For as far back as I can remember, this extra shot of luminescence has always acted as an exclamation mark. A, do this or don't do that. Somewhere along the way, my conscience got hardwired into my observations of the world, and I don't know if this is normal. If I ever meet anyone else like me, this is the first thing I'll ask. Cash or credit, the woman belches out, and I smell the alcohol on her breath. Something sharp and sweet, like whiskey. I take the pizza box with my left hand and hold out the money with my right. The woman wraps her fingers around the bills, and I see the state of her nails, how she's chewed them down to the quick. Their beds are the color of a plum, and there's just the tiniest bit of black hovering over each one. As the woman moves, the black doesn't track with her hand. Instead, it becomes five dark, quickly dispersing chemtrails, formed and floating between us. What it means is that the gangrene is not in her hands. It's in her energy. The pizza money bound tight in her fist, the woman turns to collect her holder from the porch. As she slings its strap over a shoulder, her eyes land on some part of me and she spins around. The same hand holding my payment shoots forward, fingers flanging out then wrapping themselves around my wrist. They twist until my birthmark is visible. When I try to pull free, the woman releases the bills caught between us to get a better hold. Immediately, they're plucked away by the ever-present wind, shot up and over the house along with a few dozen fall leaves that, against the moonlit sky, look eerily like a flock of wingless birds. 
Stop it, I shout, working to dislodge my arm from the woman's grasp while keeping hold of the night's dinner. Determined to get a better look, the woman turns my arm until the inner portion of my right wrist is visible. I can feel the moist heat of her breath on the skin there, just beneath my birthmark. A pale brown stain, roughly three inches wide and half that tall, positioned just above the green veins over my palm. For those who know their geography, it looks like the Australian mainland minus the northeastern tip of Cape York. You, the woman's voice come up from beneath her downturned head, is pure ruin. Cigarettes screaming, reflux, whiskey, abuse, abuse, abuse. The woman tilts back her head and looks up at me with electric blue eyes, the bagged skin around them retracted. Why are you here? she screams into my face. I stumble back. The woman follows. You need to leave, I say with more authority than I feel. Leave or I'll call the police. I bump into the storm door and drop the pizza box on the porch. It rattles where it lay, the wind's bony fingers catching on its lid. Tears suddenly half-mooned in the woman's eyes, she points at me with the nailless finger. You aren't supposed to be here! I hear the clack of Barbara's heels on the dining room floor and turn to shout, Call 911! Immediately the clacking stops, then starts anew, diminishing as Barbara heads back the way she came, gone to find a phone. With surprising dexterity, the delivery woman sprints across the space between us and takes my face in her hands. They should have killed you, she shouts in a voice both ripped and ragged, the voice of someone ruined by an unbearable thing. I shove the woman away and slide around the storm door's edge, yanking it closed behind me. Before she can take hold of the handle, I slam its locking mechanism into place. I've got them on the line, Barbara shouts from somewhere far removed from the front door. They're sending someone now. The woman backs up to the edge of the porch. The look on her face, utter devastation. They promised me, she whispers, swaying. Without warning, she lunges towards the door. I watch through its clear pane as the tip of the woman's fingers collapse against it, the distal bones buckling and rolling under, her knuckles following, smashing against the glass. I see it when the skin there splits over the shiny white bone, I recoil at the little bursts of red so like the yellow guts of bugs exploded on a windshield. They should have killed you! The woman screams, lips trembling. She slaps the flat of a hand on the pane between us and leans closer, so I can see every stripe and freckle in her cerulean eyes. She takes a deep breath and screams at me through the glass. They should have killed you when you were born! My heart beat in my ears. I watch through the fogged pane as suddenly calm. The woman turns and, like a zombie, walks away. She drips blood all the way to her truck, jumps up into the cab and pulls out of the parking lot, no problem. She turns left onto the riverfront road and disappears at a casual Sunday morning speed.